The title of the session is The End of Life as We Know It, Exploring Innovation in End of Life Support. Um, our speakers this afternoon are Carrie Deacon and Daniel Farr from Nesta. Um, now, I am a great believer in with conferences that we're actually rather challenged and provoked to really think about our practice and what we do. So I've asked Carrie and Daniel to be quite provocative uh, in what they are saying and challenging. So please be prepared. Carrie and Daniel. Hello, um, good afternoon and, and welcome. I hope you've been enjoying your day so far. So my name is Carrie Deacon, this is Dan Farag. We're gonna act as a bit of an innovation duo. Hopefully it won't be a comedy duo, but we'll see. Um, so today we are gonna talk about innovation. Uh, innovation, particularly in end of life. We do not have all of the answers. If we did, we wouldn't be here. Um, we're here to kind of open up some discussions, offer a bit of food for thought from some of our learning and lessons, but hopefully we'll draw on your knowledge and expertise too. So what we're going to cover, we're going to talk about what we think about innovation. So um, I'm no doubt you've talked already about innovation today. I know there's posters featuring it, workshops featuring it. So I thought it'd be useful to start with a common language around innovation and what we mean. We're going to talk about what we've been learning in, in different fields and what we think this might offer, um, what, what challenges there are in making innovation happen. And we're going to talk about that specifically in the context of end of life and what that means. And hopefully we'll have time to open up and, and have some discussions. So, we are from an organisation called Nesta. Has anyone heard of Nesta other than in the, in the conference pack before today? If you've heard of Nesta, can you put your hands up? Quite a few it's of you, which impressive. is great. Great. So, we are an innovation foundation based in the UK but working internationally. And we care about making great ideas happen. Ideas that address some of the big challenges of our time. So, we cover a whole array of different fields, but really trying to address some challenges that we think that the force of innovation should be directed to. Now, innovation is talked about a lot in lots of different fields nowadays. But really, are we directing our attention of innovation to the right things? So that's what we're, we're there to talk about. We think of innovation not just as ideas, but a whole spectrum from looking at opportunities and challenges all the way to really shifting systems and creating a new normal. And we operate across this spectrum. Um, and that's quite important because we're looking to draw expertise and learning from all different ways of creating innovation. A lot of the time, the discussions of innovation focus on the early parts, but really we're only going to make innovation happen, become a new normal, as if we're operating all along there. So we're thinking about it in different ways at different levels, but trying to create a new normal. Thanks, Kerry. Um, so this, we're, we're hoping this is going to be a bit more participatory rather than us just talking at you. So I want to start with a question um, and thinking about the future. Just a quick show of hands whether people think that the future is technology or people powered. So if you, you think there's lots of technology coming through in the future, can you just raise your hands? That's going to influence the end of life care. Okay. And if you think that actually it's going to be more dominated by people powered type solutions and innovations. People are sitting on the fence. I didn't see everyone's hands go up. Um, and so what's interesting is that I agree with both. So we, we at Nesta, and particularly within Health Lab, believe that it shouldn't be one or the other. And we, we actually um, don't do much clinical innovation, because I think there's actually lots of people working in that space. We kind of focus more on the social innovation space, where we believe the future is the combination of social people-powered solutions working alongside the, the more digital Powered. So it's the combination of and the relationship between the social and digital aspects of um, the future of the healthcare, which we're really interested in. And we kind of have these three broad goals and objectives around the social um, innovation space works on actually how do we develop new networks, relationships that give people more power and control over looking after their health and well-being um, and help them make the choices that they think are important to them. But actually, there is lots of disruptive digital technologies um, and actually many of them like are on our wrists already and kind of in our, in our pockets on our phones that we can start to use 
to start to use data knowledge differently, which also gives people power and control over the choices they make as well. But the combination of those things we think is quite an interesting mix um, and potentially could be an interesting thing to think about as we think about the future of end of life care as well. But all of that stuff is, is actually quite hard to put into systems and lots of public policy systems are really complex, adaptive, ever changing and changing at such a pace that we also need to think about how these, these new ideas and innovations come to bear within systems and scale and grow. Um, so those three combination of things is quite challenging, but that's what we kind of spend most of our time working on and working with others on as well. Um, so we wanted to share some of our learning about supporting some of those both social, digital, and thinking about how things come to bear in complex systems that we think might be helpful for you guys as you think about the future. Does that sound okay? Great. So, Kerry talked about the innovation spiral, and we kind of anchor all of our work around the innovation spiral, and it looks pretty simple and beautiful, right? It's kind of this lovely curve. Uh, are people familiar with that? Have they seen that before? No. They're quite a quiet audience, aren't they? <laughs> Has anyone seen that before? No, yeah. oh, great. And so it takes you through this logical progression of, actually, we can see an opportunity or a bit of a problem we need to try and think differently about. Uh, and then you go through a process of generating ideas, and then you start to test it in the real world, kind of logical process around it. Once you've tested it, you've got a bit of uh, understanding of if it works or not, start to build the evidence base. And then once you think you've got the answer, the logical progression is actually let's scale this and spread it across the country. Does that sound familiar to people? Yeah, typical government way of working, actually, let's generate the business case about how we roll this out. Um, so the true path of innovation looks a bit more like this, if I'm honest. It's messy, it's back and forth, it's, there's lots of ambiguity, there's lots of uncertainty. Um, but the way we think about progressing ideas in complex systems tends to be, again, more true to that than, than the, the beautiful linear spiral that we, we tend to talk about. Um, and the problem with generating new ideas and innovations and testing them out in the real world is, you know, the innovation world is, is, is a bit like this. We, we love bubbles. They're kind of new, shiny things that sparkle. Um, and actually, the systems and people are not short of new ideas, actually. We are a country full of new ideas, and we're great at generating them. Um, the problem is we're not great at thinking about how they all fit together, which is why we found that picture of bubbles converging. Because um, when they converge, they get really messy, and actually that's when the adoption of an innovation becomes even trickier. Um, so innovation, I think our view is it's a bit like this. It's a bit messy. It's a contact sport. You have to get your hands dirty. You have to test it in the real world. There isn't one way of scaling um, an adoption. You have to make sure context is taken into, into account. Um, and it's not just the contextual geographical factors. It's people are at the heart of many social innovations. Um, and that makes it even more complex because actually people have to go through their own learning curve, which is another challenge for scaling and growing innovations is we tend to do a lot of this, actually. We're kind of all too busy doing the day to day. Does this sound familiar to people? Um, and actually, the, the innovators are great at testing the ideas out in the real world and saying, look, this really worked. But they sometimes leave the rest of the world behind them and everyone else is a bit too busy to pay attention. So there's a real challenge about how we share the learning, how do we spread the learning, how do, we, how do we do this easier? And I think events like and conferences like today are really critical to that. Um, but again, if we look at the challenge that the systems are trying to tackle, it's huge. And it's not only huge, it's ever changing. So we're trying to improve care for people and end of life care for people. But the demand, as we know, I'm not gonna kind of preach so you've probably heard this lots. Demand is growing, it's becoming ever more complex. So we're trying to test out ideas, prove it works, but in a space that is constantly evolving and changing. Um, and we need to understand and play to that complexity, I think. Um, but we, we kind of like this, this definition of how do you know you've won is actually when, when you scale to the point where you've matched the level of need, which for me creates a challenge because the need is always changing and always growing. So have we ever actually scaled anything truly um, to best effect? is a question I have in my head. And all of this creates a big challenge for, for innovation, the innovation space of what we've got this is this ever-changing demand, ever-growing demand, new ideas being generated, but we're really struggling to scale them because it's really complicated and ever-changing. We, we create what, this call, what we call the scaling chasm where we're actually, the gap between where we want to be and where we need to get to 
is huge and growing day by day. Does this sound familiar to people? I'm not sure if I'm sharing our learning or just saying, actually, this is really tricky. It is really tricky, and that's why we think to overcome some of the challenges we're seeing in the end-of-life care space, but also in the health and care space in its entirety, needs a slightly different response, a different response that involves and starts to tap into the wisdom of everyone in this room, but everyone outside of this room within communities as well. Um, but actually, some of the challenges we're seeing around supporting innovation is made even worse by where we kind of invest our time, effort, and money, because we, we tend to invest in understanding and proving new ideas works, but actually we don't put enough time, effort, thinking about how we spread and adopt. And this came from um, a document, a publication by the King's Fund, as in we spend almost 1.2 billion um, on proving ideas that work, but only a tiny, tiny portion about how they play out in systems, which I think says it all, actually. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging future, but we're hopeful. <laughs> We are indeed. And I think if you look at your field, we are kind of pretty impressed. You've got an amazing innovation pedigree. You know, you've, you were born out of a movement to do something different. And you kind of can look at problems differently than perhaps sometimes in the health system. So it's, it's kind of a really great springboard in which you could kind of grow from. Um, and part of why we're so excited is the position you hold in, in the community as a charity for many of you and in the health system. You can cross divide, you can see things through different lenses, which we think is an incredibly um, great place to be. We've seen, looking at end-of-life experiences, there's loads of innovation out there. You know, we're probably talking about different, different things uh, across today, tomorrow, and at other times. Lots of um, opportunities, but it's a really complex field, I think. Lots of complexities which are making this quite challenging. And perhaps, at times, some of the innovation is focusing on the wrong bits of the problems. Uh, perhaps looking at it only from an individual or an organisational perspective and not seeing the bigger picture. Are we focusing on what we think is the real need? So as a society, we often talk, you know, I've heard lots of conversations which the, we've lost the art of talking about and dealing with death. So does that change what we're all here for? Does it mean that our innovation problem is actually something quite different than perhaps we conceived? So I was talking to Sarah earlier. Two years ago, I was lucky enough to encounter a project called Compassionate Neighbours. Are many of you familiar with the Compassionate Neighbours project? Can you raise your hands just so I can see? Loads of you. So I'm not going to talk to you about it. In fact, there's lots of other people who are going to tell you, could tell you the experience, warts and all, in much more detail. Are any of the hospices who have been adopting or working on compassionate neighbours here? So these are the people I would go to and talk to some of the detail. But I will give you a perspective from why we chose to decide to work with compassionate neighbours. So I was looking for some ideas that really demonstrated the, the role of what we call people power. Um, how you could work with the communities and enable people um, to, to do things in a different way alongside public services or to achieve outcomes. And this popped into the application process, and I was really quite excited by it. I could see that there was talk of power in a different way. Power of people in communities, the power of the institution of hospice, the, the power of professionals, but perhaps breaking down some of those barriers. And that's what I, I found quite interesting. Um, the Compassionate Neighbours project was really looking to kind of change things. But it was also interesting as a sign and a symptom saying that perhaps we could experiment of working across different organisational boundaries. So this was born in St Joseph's Hospice, but the proposal was about working in other hospices. And what some of the challenges that we've seen in innovation that Dan talked about, I felt it was an opportunity for us to learn how to work together with the, the challenges of that. But across eight different hospices, we would learn to learn together. 
which is an interesting kind of innovation challenge in itself. How we would make stuff work, how we would challenge what it actually was, how we would enable a bigger narrative about this. And there's probably been some pros and cons along the way, but it gave me an idea that a different way of working is possible. And that I think is quite exciting about provoking different narratives, about spending time differently with people, about the role of the hospice in the community and, and, and things like that. I, I thought that was an idea that showed huge, huge opportunities for us. It also has kind of connected some dots around um, kind of ways of working. Um, however, I think it's not a simple journey to growth as we've talked about before. And I think that in itself is a huge lesson. What it demonstrates to us though, in spite of getting to eight different areas, is that there's always gonna be challenges in kind of creating these new ways of working. And perhaps this is a sign of a different way of working, but it's also shown that there's some underlying symptoms that we maybe need to think about and resolve as a movement, as an end of life, um, if we really want to change end of life care. So, as Dan alluded to, how we look at the problem and how we look at how, what the need is for innovation needs to be thought about through lots of different lenses. So I think in our experience um, so far, you, I think hospices are really good at thinking about individuals, thinking about person-centred care. You know, if we talk about that in other contexts, it's actually a lot more challenging. I think, Dan, you were saying you think, in, compared to some other areas, that it could be a couple of years ahead, a few years ahead, more challenging narratives around that. The role of the hospice, what is the role of the hospice going forward? And how do you place yourself in the ecosystem? How do you place yourself within the ecosystem to kind of join up the dots and create the innovation? Are you the one bringing people together? What are you looking up to? What are you looking down to to make this change happen? So we see that there's these signs and symptoms and really like some forerunners across health and social care which are demonstrating that another way of working is possible. So here are some of the examples that we see. Everything from um, North London Cares. I don't know whether you've seen North London Cares, any of the Cares family. Any of you familiar with that? So that's a model which is about changing the dynamics of how young and old people connect how we live together in communities in different ways. Um, the, obviously, we mentioned the Compassionate Neighbours project, but really looking at how we look at, as a system, this whole approach, um, what that means. We think that there's forerunners to another way, and I would classify um, Compassionate Neighbours alongside that. And I think for me, so I, I have the pleasure of working across different parts of the system and different parts of the country. Where we start to see the most exciting new innovative models kind of emerging, which you, you probably guess we like a rainbow. There's lots of rainbows in our presentation because we think the future's bright. Um, <laughs> the, common, the common aspect is it, it's, it's the power of different conversations between an institution, between a patient, between uh, the patient's network, between peoples and communities. But how that grows and how that spreads is always a challenge because quite often the system, if you again look at the complex map we kind of sketched out of innovations in the past have really focused on policies, processes, trying to make things as lean and as efficient as possible. But actually the next generation of innovation is starting to look at actually how do we start to create connections, shifts in mindsets, practices and behaviours, um, which we think are, are really important to kind of the future of community centred support. And all of this kind of leads to um, this. I've changed my shoes since then. Mine were the silver ones, carries were the other ones. Um, but I think what gives us hope, particularly when we look at and, and kind of meet people like yourselves, is that there is such passion, particularly in this part of the, the system, that um, we think is the most important ingredient for driving the future of care. And I, and I say the future of care, not just end of life care, because I think you guys are leading the way and there's so much you can share with the rest of the health and care sector um, and the rest of the world that it's almost criminal that we're not finding better ways to amplify and share it with others as well. Um, but we'd like to kind of shift a little bit and start to get you thinking and talking as well because we think the power of conversation is part of the answer as well. Um, but we think, so the end of life care 
as we know, it was kind of a title we came up with, but we actually think now is the time to kind of reframe and rethink about the challenge of, um, that the sector's facing, because the need is huge, the demand is huge, and there's got to be a different way of thinking about how do we take the best of what sits in this room within the sector and spread it in a very different way. Um, how do you mobilise communities in different ways? How do we think about the, the role of the hospice as a, as a PowerPoint within people, within communities, in a slightly different way? Um, so we think it's partly redefining the challenge around end of life. So when we were thinking of what the challenge is, what's the purpose, what do you exist for, this definition was on the NHS website. So the aim of hospice care is to improve the lives of people who have an incurable illnesses, illness. Um, hospices provide care for people from the point of which their illness is diagnosed as terminal to the end of their life, however long that may be. Now, hands up if you agree that is your aim and purpose. So a few of you, hands up if you disagree that's your aim and purpose. People have gone quiet, it's worrying. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people maybe, maybe that's not resonating, but it's quite interesting to think of what is your aim and purpose in the system. Is that still it? Is that defining what you do, how you live? Do you see it quite differently? Um, because I think that could be an interesting driving force for you going forward. So as I've talked about, what, um, there's these different levels. What role do hospices play in those different levels? How much do you think you have a role in shaping the ecosystem? What part of it do you play? What part of it do you play in the community with patients all the way up? Is that different than you expected? Is that changing or does that need to change? Actually, Carrie, can we just go back one? Yeah. I was stunned by the silence, actually. Um, so this is what the world... So if you Google hospice care, this is what comes up on the NHS website. So if that's not what you're about, um, can you just spend two minutes talking to the person next to you and share what, what is so different to what you're doing now to that definition? Because if that's wrong, we definitely need to get nhs.co.uk to change it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a minute, just talking to the person next to you. We just, I'm it's all right, we'll do it. Curious to, to, just to get people's responses. Um, did you look like you wanted to yep. challenge that? Oh, please do. Yeah, we, we were just chatting and saying, well, it's a bit more about care, more than care. It's about training and it's about research, evidence base. And also this whole idea of being diagnosed as a terminal, terminal to the end of their life. My colleague was just saying, you know, we start sometimes right at the beginning of a severe heart failure, but this, it, it has changed. It's not that that comes across a bit as cancer, probably because Dame Sicily is there. <laughs> so I agree. I think you guys do so much more than that definition. So um, we need to find someone to change that. Yeah. Any other thoughts, though? What about someone down the front? Anyone around here? Got one more. Pass over. The, that um, comment up there is about what we do to people, and that doesn't really fit with how I want to work with someone to meet their own goals and what I'm empowering them to do. That's a bit paternalistic. Fantastic. Interesting point there. We've got, we've got lots of nodded Any others over here. It's, it's, a deficit, it's a deficit-based model, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That was exactly our thing. It's, it's about resource provision and those things rather than person-centred and family-centred and community-centred. So we get the same view. Fantastic. One over here, Dan. Where? Uh, oh, where? Yeah, it's just, um, we were talking about the fact that we don't just look after people who have an illness. So we've been talking about frailty, we've been talking about old age. Um, and also it's not just about the people who are dying as well. A huge amount of hospice work is about bereavement support. So it's about looking after the family. And we always say actually a good death is the legacy for the family and the community and the friends that we leave behind. Fantastic. We've got one more over here. Um, hi, I think uh, firstly, I would just like to talk about the fact that 
we've got Dame Cicely Saunders up there. And I know you've used this as a point of innovation, and this was an incredible lady and an incredible innovator, but this was a long time ago now. Uh, it wasn't just 20 years ago, it was 50 or 60 years ago. So I'm not demeaning her legacy, um, but hospice has changed significantly in that time, and I think we need to be addressing that. As an organisation that's no longer a hospice, I'm from Compton Care, and we've taken that decision based on our patients' views. Um, uh, our premise is about caring for people with complex and incurable conditions. So that includes people, as ever, several people have said, who are, don't actually have a terminal prognosis. So, and the stretch of what we're doing now is much, much broader than that. But I think also what you've said there is the world thinks I'm afraid I don't agree that the world is the NHS. So the NHS thinks that's one of the challenges we have, is that there's still a vast proportion of the NHS think that hospices or other palliative care providers are just there for the last few days or last few weeks of life. And that view still predominates. So I think that's part of our challenge. We're innovating and moving forward. Um, but we have to make sure that everyone knows we're innovating and moving forward, particularly our NHS partners and our other third sector partners. Thanks. And I think what you've just done is illustrated what we were saying before. Do you remember the, the wheel and people too busy to notice? You guys are way ahead um, than much of the NHS, but the NHS don't realise it. And I think you're, you guys are too busy innovating to be able to amplify and share what you're doing as well. So it's kind of a bit of a catch-22. Um, but I agree, this isn't reflective of what most hospices do that I know of. But that's what the world says about you at the moment. So there's, there is an issue of communication, people recognising the, the, the amount of great practice and innovation that does happen. But the other thing I, I think you guys are great at, you are you know, beacons of power in your community. And you hold a huge amount of power in your community. Um, and that gives me hope about you guys leading the way forward around the future of care in itself. Should we move on to the next question, Carrie? We'll come, we'll, we'll come back. Yeah. So um, I think what was really interesting as well is, is, is how different people perceive you and how you take the, the system, the community, everyone with you on that journey. Because I think you guys have probably moved on. But has the community moved on? Have people moved on? Have, has the system moved on with you? So we talked about then what is the role of hospices or, or palliative care providers in supporting this system. So it'd be great, again, perhaps to throw that out, a couple of minutes of discussions. Um, you can speak to someone different or speak to the same person, but how do you see your role within that? We talked a little bit about it. Some of the answers I kind of started focusing on, but what is your role within that? Two minutes. Okay, sorry to interrupt your discussions again. Hopefully we can keep building on these though. Any thoughts from anyone? I think we're a lot bigger in the, in the system and in our community. We were talking about what hospices do in the context of providing volunteering for people that are recovering from mental Ill health. It's part of their recovery journey. Uh, that work we're doing with schools and colleges to demystify what hospices do, to promote careers and opportunities, work in health and care. And those things aren't always captured or measured or we're not commissioned to do them, but we do them as part of our work within the community and the system. Any other views? Here in I the don't middle. know how to get to you. Can I, I pass it? this one back? <laughs> Thank you. I thought you were just ignoring me. Um, I needed to, just to have a word because I work in the NHS, so I just wanted to pick up... Um, oh, on well the done. Oh. Um, I, only because um, there's, it, it's a bit of a myth, you know? We, we absolutely understand in the NHS around what our... Um, partners offer. Uh, I'm lucky enough to work alongside um, a hospice in North Warwickshire. We've, we have services where it's a blended integrated approach. So we run services where we both employ staff, we work together. And actually that means the message is getting out there that I would like to think that none of my teams 
would ever have a problem in describing what the hospice delivers alongside our services because we couldn't do this on our own. You know, the district nurses that I manage need hospice support and vice versa. So I think we've broken down a lot of barriers and we absolutely understand in the NHS, you know, through the work that some of my teams are doing with third sector um, colleagues means that we're spreading that message all the time. So I think we're moving in the right direction. That's great to hear. Great to hear, yeah. Mm. Got uh, I think that hospices have um, a, a big role within their local community, but I think that hospices also need to be careful not to be all things to all people and to dilute what they're doing, um, because you have to be able to make the most impact with the resources that you've got. So to, it's, it's, I think it's about impact and, and trying to reach as many people and support as many people with the resources that you've got, because you've also got to remain sustainable. I think that's one yeah. of the dangers that hospices can just try to, try to do so much, but they need to hold on to that, that a core element of what's going to give the biggest impact. And actually a lot of that comes through working with the wider community in different models and innovative ways. Can agree more, yep. And I can say probably as a grant funder, sometimes the incentives to do things which might not be the things that you want to do are sometimes led by the money as well. So, some here. Um, I agree with that. I think there is a danger about um, dilution. Nonetheless, I think the art of this is about showcasing role modelling, inspiring and influencing the care of far, far more people than we could ever see. Um, and that doesn't dilute us, that lets other people take the best and the worst of what we have done and, and tailor it for their services and their, their populations. Any last points on that? One here. I think that we have the potential in palliative care to be radical political activists that independently funded hospices can turn on a sixpence in a way that the NHS cannot, that working in enabled networks between NHS palliative care services in hospitals and community and uh, voluntary sector supported organizations offering parallel services and complementary services is an absolutely fantastic ecosystem and that the NHS could do well to look at it and think about which bits of it could apply to other patient groups and other communities. Fantastic. And, and I guess how many of you feel like you are able to be radicals in your system? People feel like they've got the space to be radicals, which is fantastic. That's a great thing to feel and to operate. Many people would say that they don't feel like they have that space or that privilege. So that's great. So I think the final question that we want to pose to you is that you know from from our perspective again we don't work in depth in the system as you guys do um, but we can see this this kind of heady mix of you've got a great history of innovation um, you guys do it really really well you're full of passionate people that are there to support communities to do things in a slightly different way the demand for care is huge and going to continue to grow as well so there's this kind of almost perfect storm where you've got the power to lead and shape the future of not only how the end of life care sector evolves, but the future of how the care sector evolves and be radical, as you just said. Um, so we can kind of see this movement emerging. Um, but I'm curious, we're curious to see your views about what role you think the hospices play in almost reigniting that movement that um, was originally born by Cicely Saunders, which is why we put the picture up earlier. Um, of reigniting the movement so more people can benefit from the great work and great care um, and great community connections that you guys have. So spend a little bit longer on this question because we think this is the most interesting, the most pivotal one uh, that we can see. So maybe five or ten minutes on this. Find someone new. If you want to get up and move and talk to someone else, please do as well. Okay. <laughs> Hope you've had a good discussion. Any initial thoughts from people? It's really nice to hear the buzz of people talking as well. There's lots of energy around this one. But any would like to share the discussion? Up there. I was talking to Katie from St Christopher's about the importance of marketing and communications. And if I had £40,000 and was still running a hospice, which I'm not, I'd invest it in more communications than maybe another nurse. Because actually I think dilution is a good thing. I was just saying if you drop a drop of Ribena into 
big glass of water, you can make it all go red, I've discovered. Um, <laughs> so I think we can dilute and influence more people and shouldn't be too nervous about that. Dan, one over here. So we talked about the concept of everyone benefiting and we know that there's, um, we, talk, we all talk a lot about how we can support care homes and more people to, to die in care homes. But actually we're all sitting here knowing that's the right thing to do. And we all have, um, are doing it maybe in some areas and we all want to do it. But as ever, I think funding is an issue. So we talked about, is there a way that we can pilot um, the best model of supporting care homes with some central grant program to do something really tangible that we can then, as a movement, get behind and say, right, okay, this is the next big, big area we need to focus on. Fantastic. Something Fantastic. about focus being quite important as well moving forward. Interesting. Sure. Uh, we talked about the, um, <clears throat> the whole in the issue of grassroots movement needing to be bottom up. And that's why it's actually quite, hos quite difficult for hospices who are institutions in our own right to, to do that and to initiate it. But we can do it by sharing the knowledge that we have. And if we spend uh, some thought as to how we deliberately want to inform a wider public about what we do and what they can do to help us with our agenda, then I think actually you, you start a movement. Other thoughts? One over here. Eat to it. <laughs> I, it's sort of um, been said before down the front there, but I certainly resonate with um, increasing the marketing. Um, we've just launched uh, an appeal after 25 years to try and raise £7.5 million. And we've been very unfortunate, very fortunate to engage the services of our lo local newspaper, who are doing a half-page article about the hospice in all its guises every Friday afternoon. And I think it was President Obama said, when you start telling stories, you start connecting people. And we've noticed that each week as we tell a different story, it might be about fundraising, it might be about volunteering, it might be about our vet service, veterinary service, um, and suddenly, we're seeing far more interest in the Living Well Centre, far more people signing up to the lottery, far more people just making inquiries through the website. So we're doing that through storytelling because it connects people. And storytelling is such a powerful way of actually getting people more interested in, in, into an issue. But also comes back to the point of, are we asking people the right question and asking for help at times when we need help? Yeah. Um, it links to both of these two points, but I think we're a bit too nice about it all. So I think we've just got to be a bit more political and a bit more, maybe don't tell such sanitised stories about how we always get it right or what's really good about everything that we do and talk a bit more about some of the, more publicly about some of the challenges that we do face and put and get, as Sean was saying, you know, get others to argue the case for there to be a change um, in a more political way than we are at the moment. That's interesting, getting your community to be the challengers and the ambassadors. One more here. Hi. I think um, a byproduct of um, communication, communicating to, to the public, to healthcare professionals, to our communities, is it would lead on to early referrals. And we know that early referral to a hospice can improve outcomes. And I think that's an area that we can, we can reignite and, and get away from the fact that it's all about end of life, very end of life. Hi, I'm Kate from University Hospitals Derby. I'm part of the Enhanced Bed team and uh, our team, just linking up to what somebody was talking about there, about uh, nursing homes. So we work with the Nightingale Macmillan Unit, which is a specialist palliative unit at, at the hospital, but we are a small bespoke team that go and help people in crisis at home and also facilitate discharge from the hospital. And we put people into a specialist palliative bed within a nursing home setting. So we have block purchase beds and also spot purchase beds. And part of our role is to support that patient and support the family uh, right through the journey that they're with us and either discharge home if that's their preferred place of care and death or to even be fast-tracked or even to die while they're in our bed. And we will arrange all of that and support the family and link back to the unit for specialist bereavement support if necessary. But the advantage of that is we can trickle pra good practice to the nursing home. So I will perhaps do uh, an hour-long care 
just get the carers rather than the nursing. Just work with the people who are on the real coal face and just give them a bit of confidence with techniques. And so for mouth care, for example, or reposition, repositioning people when they're very, very terminal and, you know, and, and, and how to sort of act with people and take their time and, and how to be with the family. So that we, we help to sort of get best practice as we see it to other areas in that way. Fantastic. And I guess there's maybe or there's a lot of discussions about actually a lot of the good ideas already exist, but how do we get it? So the scaling challenge that we talk, so there's some great practice, but how do we kind of replicate and copy some more of that? Um, so as a, as a hospice chief executive, so speaking very personally, uh, the, our funding situation is very paralyzing for us as an organization and makes it very difficult for us to innovate. But I also think what makes it difficult to innovate is the um, it's very difficult to fail so we hold public money our reputation is is king and certainly when I previously worked with an old boss who used to work in the city she would say well we would invest in 10 projects knowing only one of them will succeed and as a as a charity sector more broadly than hospices that's a very difficult um, thing for us to do um, in my role as a chief exec, if I had my dream scenario, I would run an incubation uh, work stream alongside our normal program. I think it's very hard to do this alongside what we already do, and there's lots of nervousness, particularly around risk. But actually, if we could keep doing what we do, but specifically run innovation streams alongside that and test and be prepared for things to succeed and scale, but also to go wrong and to learn from them, then I think um, we could do something very powerful. I couldn't agree more. And you know, the thing about innovation is you have to kind of, to some extent, embrace failure as a learning point rather than anything else. Rather than you know, you don't set yourselves up to fail, but you set yourselves up to learn. Um, and so, just just a collection of thoughts as you you guys were talking. It's almost the the environment in which we're working. I, I appreciate is extremely tough. The funding situation makes innovation and creating the time and space to think differently about what you do and how you do it. Um, doesn't help. There's a, there's a tension around dilution. Actually, are we moving away from what's, what's core to our business versus actually how do we think differently about what we do and share what we do really well to the rest of the world? But again, coming back to this question, I think what came out for me really strongly is you guys are really uniquely positioned with a view, with a really deep view and connection to what's important to people and communities and how that demand and need is ever changing, but you've also got one foot into the system and recognizing some of the challenges that they're facing. However, sometimes it feels like you've been gravitating more towards what the system wants as the provider rather than where you guys started, this is my view of the world, was what's important to people and communities is paramount. So I guess the question for me and the challenge in my head is actually how do we slightly rebalance and make the most of the fact that you can look both ways at the same time and recognize that everyone's trying to do the same thing and do the best for people and communities. Because I think there isn't institutions like hospices that have that dual view, and I think that's quite special. Um, but I also think that given the environment that you are operating in, funding constraints, really challenging environment, but also need getting increasingly larger and more complex. There is a need to completely rethink what happens and how we do it and protect a bit of time, to your point, for innovation and that thinking time. Um, and I think at Nesta, we recognize that that isn't an easy thing to do. And it's kind of almost why we exist as an innovation foundation, to provide a bit of time, space, support, at times funding to help this thinking happen. Um, which leads us to the next point, and I've got two minutes left, is today we've um, launched a new program of work called Social Movements for Health. Um, which is intended to give people a bit of protected time, space, support, uh, non-financial and potentially financial support to think about how do we start to make movements for health. So actually, how do we start to catalyze a different way of thinking, working, um, make it meaningful? Because there's been lots of talk recently over the last two years of social movements for health, but I don't think we really understand as a system and as a, as a country what that really means. So we're launching this today. It'd be great if... There are some applications coming from this part of the world and this end-of-life care sector because we think there is something quite special 
just to give you a sense of timing and dates for your diary, um, here they are. Your applications need to be, I think it's quite a light touch expression of interest by the end of November. Um, sorry, end of December, November. just before <laughs> Christmas. We are at the end of November. <laughs> I'm going back in time, not forwards. <laughs> um, so any other questions on, on the program of work that um, was launched today, do let us know. But we'd also just like to thank you for your time and for inviting us here to be slightly challenging, be slightly provocative, um, but hopefully generate some new discussions and, and hopefully give you some things to think about as you kind of think about the future of the end-of-life care sector. Thank you. Thank you very much.